It's holiday time, and as you know, um, uh, I am associated with a particular holiday. And, but what's interesting, and our really that kicks it off, is you you shared with me that your research has shown that over twenty percent of people, over twenty percent of people, say that their families have bizarre, bizarre, unique holiday, holiday tradition. tradition. So that led us to, of course, the the most holiday famous. that is the most famous and the most bizarre is made famous on uh, my former show, Seinfeld. There's Christmas, there's Hanukkah, there's Kwanzaa, and, there and there's is Festivus, the festival for the rest of us, which was an actual holiday created by the father of the man who authored the episode. And that man is, of course, Mr. Dan O'Keefe, who's here with us today. Dan's a producer and a writer, uh, known for a variety of things, Beavis and Butthead, Space Force, Veep, Silicon Valley, the Drew Carey Show, and, of course, most notably, our Festivus episode. Dan, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Jason. I'm, I'm flattered to be invited on. Well, first of all, I did laugh when I read... <laughs> We'll find out the origin that you were actually invited on different times to people's houses over the holidays who were actually observing a form of festivus and didn't know that it was from your family. That has happened on a number of occasions. I am so far uh, unanimous in my streak of saying no thank you. I'm <laughs> wow. sure I hope they had a lovely time, uh, but uh, wow. I wouldn't know. Wow. Yeah, that's happened a number of times. Wow. So the origin is not what people think. Right. The, the way we... The way we sort of laid it out on the show, I guess the, the origins of those ideas may be from what you and your dad, your family created, but what, what can you walk us through for people that don't know what your organic Festivus was? My organic Festivus was a living hell on earth that <laughs> appeared at random throughout the year at an unspecified date it didn't have it wasn't really december 23rd it was whenever the fuck my father felt like it right one year there were none one year there were two uh and it arose out of the fact that my dad was basically a more feral frank costanza who spent 30 40 50 years desperately trying to turn himself into fraser crane uh he <laughs> wow. escaped from jersey the the greenville ward of jersey city which at the time was sort of like a you know a Southie. And he was the first in his family to go to college, and I think one of the first to, you know, to finish high school, and got rid of his accent at Oxford and just decided to wash the stink of Jersey off himself with excessive amounts of education, including an obsession with the plays of Samuel Beckett. Who, uh, in, <laughs> Jeez, wow. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot. Wow. And wow. It, including, and, and on his first date with my mother, he lent her a copy of the play Crap's Last Tape. Now, in the play Crap's Last Tape, it's an old man listening to her. You're, you're, you're a song and dance man. You're a stage you're, you're man. Talking, you know you're talking my language. Go ahead. Uh, an old man listening to tape recordings of a slightly younger man, listening to recordings of a slightly younger man. So the original Festivus was indeed an airing of grievances, but it was an airing of grievances in which my brothers and I were made to listen to recordings of my father complaining the year before while <laughs> listening to re recordings of my father complaining the year before wow. and, and so on and so on in a series of, of Russian nesting dolls. Uh, it was occasionally exhilarating. Most often uh, there was there was a tremendous amount of liquor involved. I mean, it was just in my later in my life, my dad lost 55 pounds by switching to light beer and started wearing suits from the 50s that fit him again. Wow. And it was like, he, he dressed like Kramer. He was wearing these like ancient hipster vintage jobs. It was crazy. Uh, and it was my father drunkenly complaining into a tape recorder about the corrosive effect of internal Reader's Digest politics, about how we had disappointed him during the year, about how my, my mother did not keep a clean Jeez. house, oh, about how his relatives were awful, which was actually kind of, you know, not always incorrect. There were... Uh, and uh, it was, there was a lot of um, strange music that was played. Uh, he played <laughs> so, um, this record containing uh, songs of the Irish Republican Army, but also oh, weird, the, the <coughs> strange novelty pop records from Germany and Italy from like the 40s, 50s, and 60s. They actually, there's an Italian version of Alvin and the Chipmunks that's the most terrifying thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and it's, it's a man, and I don't know what they were saying, <clears throat> uh, Although I was made to learn a certain amount of Italian, <laughs> that's a whole other story. Uh, 
I did not understand. It, it's a man remonstrating with a bunch of chipmunks who are who are apparently about to overthrow him. It's it's the strange and every goddamn year it was the, the chipmunks and the the uh, the the Irish rebels being hanged by the British and the strange German accordion stuff and, and all over that a, a litany of complaints and then he would encourage us to complain ourselves and then when we complained too much he would complain that we were complaining too much. It was. It was a combination of alcoholism and borderline child endangerment that should have had New York oh, State man. take us away oh, and raise us in a facility. Oh, my God. But um, at the time, you know, um, Child Protective Services just was not not up to snuff in the New York area. So uh, there you have it. So and, wait, uh, your, your family, your brother would cry. Um, you would cry. I mean, it was it was horrifying. And also it had a mm. clock nailed in a bag to the wall rather than a pole, okay, right? Yeah, the 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 the. the Festivus Pole is a, by the way, I, I should mention, I didn't author the entire episode. I, I wrote it along with Jeff Schaefer and Alec Berg, who yeah. arguably wrote some of the better stuff. But uh, the symbol is not a, a pole. Uh, that was a Schaefer joke. The, the real symbol of the holiday was my father took an ancient rusted alarm clock, put it in like a burlap sack, and then nailed it to the wall. And I don't know why. He never and told every, you. He never told you. I would what ask, it and he would always say the same thing. That's not for you to know. Wow. And I, I, I don't know what it means. And um, I still, to this day, something about the evanescence of, of, of time, of life, of youth, I don't know. I know that it was a wedding present that he and my mom got. So maybe it's something about their marriage. I don't even want to know. But uh, yeah, that's the symbol of it. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. Was your dad, so I read that you said your dad was an undiagnosed bipolar also at the time. Was this, at was, least. So was this, yeah. was there joy ever or was this, always the storm that was brewing underneath for your dad he was incredibly charismatic and uh brilliant brilliant man i mean the new york times compared his book uh, his thousand page uh, unified field theory of anthropology psychology and sociology he could compared it to mark starwin and freud in in their review uh, although now only people in japan read it but um <laughs> for some reason but uh, yeah, it was terrifying. But there were it was interspersed with moments of of joy. He was very funny. He made it funny while it was happening. But for the most part, it was uh, it was mostly like they say war is mostly boring with moments of terror. But then occasionally it's fun. Jeez, uh, jeez, Dan, <laughs> my God! And you didn't want this out there. The, the story is that your brother Mark right, spilled that, the beans accidentally. Uh, we came to the realization very young that if you go to school, elementary school, and say. Hey, we had Festivus this weekend. Have you, when was when did you have it? People will look at you and say, "Excuse me," and it will you'll immediately be put on a more rigorous beating schedule. So we we had a vow of silence that was semi formally wow. taken, and I had literally blocked it out of my mind. Uh, and then Mark goes and opens his yap at a party that uh, J Jeff Schaefer, Alec Berg, Dave Mandel, some of the executive producers, along with Jerry, the final season of the show a party they were at and they were immediately like, excuse me i want to hear more about this so then i was lured to a diner called swingers on uh on, on beverly where uh my old boss drew carey is very generously uh paying for the meals of uh of members of the writers guild and they they sort of pinned me pinned me down in a booth they sat you know around me so i couldn't get out and they said we want to talk about festivus and i i actually hadn't thought about it in years for a reason and i was like uh, oh, uh, how did you hear about that? I'm really sorry you had to take up those brain cells with that information. And they're like, no, no, we want to put it on the show. And I said, no, you really, really don't. You, you're making a terrible mistake. This, this show is a, is a perfect thing. This is the greatest sitcom in the history of television. And you want to essentially smear feces on it? You're mad. You're mad, Jeff Schaefer, Alec Berg, Dave Mandel. But, you know, uh, as it turned out, I was dead wrong. Jerry wanted to do it. And they were completely right. Now, there was, it turns out there was a version that was consumable by a mass audience. I thought that it would uh, lead to to not good things, but wow. Jeez. And the the stuff that was created for the for the television version of Festivus, <clears throat> that was all uh, that was all sort of a, a mutual mind meld, right? The poll, the feats of strength, the airing of grievances, the the general negativity around it, the, the George. Uh, attitude toward it is right. taken from reality mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to talk about it what, what runs when his father brings it up uh <laughs> but the specifics of it did change now the, the airing of grievances was the central tenet of the original right holiday, yes <laughs> but uh, and though there was always the implicit threat of violence from my father there was not actually a wrestling right of 
parental wrestling thing, nor was there a poll. That did come out of the, um, I mean, a, a strength to weight ratio was an Alec Berg joke. The poll itself was, uh, um, was Schaefer, I think the, uh, the 23rd to get a, to get a head start on Christmas. I think that was Dave. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was an unbelievable staff and people just filled in the blanks to do, to put together a more palatable version of, uh, of this, you know, remake of the Mosquito Coast that I, I lived. <laughs> Dan, do you remember? So do you remember? <laughs> I know we want to get into what it felt like writing in the writer's room for Seinfeld, et cetera. But do you remember being there when they shot that episode? What 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 went, what went through your head and what you felt emotionally watching this yeah, thing? Yeah, what was that week like for you? When, you know, here we are. It was like an out-of-body experience. And I remember thinking something that I hadn't thought since I left for college, which is my father might actually physically murder me over this. Uh, and uh, Whoa. the... Um, so it, and I couldn't tell if it was good or not. Like it's one of the things where you're, you're right. And, and yeah. obviously that happens in, in shows that are not taken partially from your childhood. Yeah. But, uh, in that case, what I was hoping was the following. I was hoping that the strike at H and H bagels, I lived around the corner from H and H bagels. I always loved that plot. Uh, that I think came from Alec and Jeff. That was really solid. And the um, the Two-Face story was mine. I thought that melded. I was hoping that Festivus would be left on the editing room floor. I thought, look, we, we have a, there's a Jerry story, a George story, a Kramer story, an Elaine story. This is a Frank story. This is a fifth story. There's no way it'll survive the editing process. So yeah. I comforted myself by saying, <laughs> it'll all be fine. They're just going to snip it around the edges and then they'll they'll come to their senses. They'll come to their senses and they'll realize, no, we don't want to do this to the show. The show does not deserve this. America does not deserve this. But as it turned out, somehow they edited 13 and a half minutes out of it. because That's how long it was. <laughs> yeah. And they oh made it gosh. actually fit together in a way that made sense and was watchable. Yeah. And I was surprised. Uh, and it's a testament to the editors and, and to the talent of the gentleman I mentioned and, and to of Jerry's vision steering the show and, and as always. And uh, so at first it was, you know, it was the five stages of, of, of grief. I, I was, you know, I was denial, I was anger, I was bargaining, all that. And eventually, <laughs> instead of acceptance, I got, I stayed in denial a long time because I found something to cling to, which was the idea that under the laws of comic sitcom gravity, this will not fit in a 22 minute episode and something's got to go. Right. And what's it going to be? Are you going to cut Julie Louis-Dreyfus? I think not. You're going to cut the, 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 the filth of my childhood that had oozed up through the cracks in the floor of that stage. And, uh, oh man, do you remember shooting that, that, that scene, the Festivus dinner scene? Around the table. What, what I remember vividly, I think there's probably, I think this is available online on bloopers, but I can't remember uh, the reason why, but Julia looked pretty bedraggled by the time she got to the table. I think like her hair was all matted down. And Sidewalk steamed. It was to parallel the, uh, the, the, the girl who looked good in one light. And right, bad in right, one light right. Exactly. And there was, <laughs> was this kind of unsavory looking guy who was hitting on her at the table. <laughs> right, right. And he said something about, you look great. And in total Julia <laughs> Elaine fashion, she goes, huh. Thanks, <laughs> you know, because she looks like hell as much as Julia could ever look like hell, and she couldn't get through it. She could. The guy's face was so great. He was one of those great character right, actors right, right. that they always found, and he did it perfectly. He did it like right on the edge, and it was. She just and that and we did take after take, and then, then you know, uh, God rest him, Jerry Stiller would get up and start going. I got a lot of problems with you people, and that we were that was it. We were done. We I remember done. a couple of things. First of all, the guy you're talking about, he uh, he was a he did a cable access show in New York City, I think out of Brooklyn, in which he reviewed pornography. He was an actual <laughs> like like he was exactly who you think he would be, and he played that perfectly. Oh I remember another thing, which was at the very beginning. Well, I, I remember I remember all of you breaking. Everyone oh, broke. Every, oh, absolutely, it. yeah. But at the very beginning, I think Julia said something to Jerry like. If we get this in one take, I'll give you a million dollars or something like that. <laughs> and needless to say, it took eight hours. Well, she personally think, made sure that we weren't going to get it. I, I, I think I, I think it took eight hours. Yeah, for, uh, it was wow, to get the table. And I think that the the guy that we're talking about, the kind of you know. Um, Borderline the show personality was guy. Collins Sleazy Friends. The <laughs> Collins actual show Sleazy Friends. Collins Sleazy Friends. I think the guy who played his cohort on the show 
turned out to be Tracy Letts, yeah, the, the now yeah. esteemed right. actor playwright. and author and playwright. Yeah, right. and, yeah. and Pulitzer Prize winner for yeah. literature. <laughs> so let me ask you a big question to clear something up that's been out yeah, there yeah. forever. So when people celebrate Festivus, they try and emulate the meal, but nobody f can actually figure out. There, there are no clear shots. People try to freeze frame it and whatever. So I've read about this. They're trying to figure it out. So what they do is they get babka from one episode. They get bagels from uh, another. Marble so they try, rye yeah. A, yeah, but sure. there are reports that there was lettuce with what looked to be meatloaf on it on the table. What was, do you, do you, oh, does I anybody know no what the meal memory. was in the Seinfeld episode? I think that uh, on the show, I'm pretty sure it was meatloaf. Yeah, meatloaf. I, there I don't you go. remember the lettuce. Cleared it up for I people. There was, a, there was a disagreeable suspect looking meatloaf that was carved up before the scene and put on everyone's plate. There you go. Uh, I think, yeah. Because nobody That's can identify not, for oh sure when they celebrate Festivus at home. So they, they emulate by, by, by grabbing from different episodes, like I said, the babka, et cetera, yeah. for the meal. But you just cleaned it up for now. People who have Festivus, meatloaf on lettuce. I mean, the yeah. real thing was, it was whatever the whatever we were having for dinner. It was usually, you know, it was a holiday, so my mom made like a chicken or something. But uh, it, was, it was by candlelight. And that, that was something my father was obsessed with, eating by candlelight. And I always thought that, that uh, he was because he thought it was like romantic or classy or something because, you know, he was from f very feral Jersey and she was from fancy Connecticut people who'd lost all their money. And then I found out, no, no, he liked to eat by candlelight because he found watching children eat disgusting. He had a horror of watching <laughs> oh my his chill, his fan. He didn't like to watch his family eat because he just found it revolting for some reason. So that's why it always had to be in almost pitch blackness. Um, Yikes. What was the fallout Yikes. from the episode in, within your family? Um, my mom was real afraid to tell my dad. Uh, Mark thought it was hilarious because he yeah. was not going to get hit by any of the blowback. It was all falling on me. Yeah. Um, uh, my other brother didn't want any part of it. Uh, and then it came out and I had to tell my dad. And at first he didn't understand. And then he got real mad. He you did. Know, like, 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 yeah, like very, very briefly, like and he, by that point he was slowing down. There wasn't so much of the throwing stuff mad level left, but he, he was very exercised. But then he saw it and he kind of liked it. And then people, you know, the reviews started coming. He started, and, he, and then he immediately became insufferably smug and thought that that episode retroactively justified every poor choice he'd ever made in his entire <laughs> life. He, he was... Oh, he was thrilled. He was over the moon. He was over the moon. Wow. So he would tell people, I'm the oh, best of us. Oh, you I'm couldn't shut him up. Wow. Oh, they, my uh, God. Ben and Jerry's made uh, like, a, yeah. like a flavor. It was like burnt caramel and uh, 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 Christmassy type flavors. And it, uh, he, they sent a poster. My dad framed it and insisted on like hanging it on the wall of the kitchen yeah. in a place where it really didn't fit. And then he got mad. He punched it once, but he wouldn't move it. So there was like the... Festivus ice cream ad with a like broken glass in it. Very unsafe. <laughs> oh, uh, so he, wow. but he, you know, he was he was uh, for the last uh, few, the last decade and a half of his life or more, he could not have been prouder. Could not have been proud. Speaking of uh, wow. uh, the the ice cream, so I just you know I went online and I I went to just Amazon and typed in Festivus related things, and here's what came up. Lots of polls, you know, buy a Festivus poll. Uh, there's a board game. There were fireplace stockings, sweaters, mugs, tree or ornaments, playing cards, T-shirts, refrigerator magnets, and the ice cream flavor. Do you ever see anything from any of that? <laughs> Fuck no. Um, no. 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 I mean, no, no. I mean, look... Uh, Anyway, uh, no, I, I, that, I would love to, but here's the thing. Um, technically, I mean, although I, I, if I, if I ever read a book about it, uh, another, a real book, yeah. uh, not that spite pile that you assigned your name to, thank, thank you again, <laughs> uh, I, I can certainly refer to it. But as far as I know, in the context of the show, the copyright to that holiday is owned by Castle Rock Communications, and they're welcome to it. And as of right now, it's an open source holiday. Like wow. someone contacted me a billion years ago saying, I think it was on, uh, through a third party. Hey, I want to sell these polls. I'm in Wisconsin. I hope that's cool. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I, I don't need to know. You know, like people, it, it, so many different people make, you know, small amounts of money, I'm guessing, off yeah. of it. I see no part of that. I want no part of that. I don't need a part of that. That's yeah. if they want to do that, you know, it's, um, it's entered into the culture, which I'm, I have mixed emotions about, obviously. But if, if, uh, if Satanists want to protest against, 
fascism in Florida by putting up a display with beer cans and putting the word Festivus on it in the Florida State House, which happened. Uh, hey, good for you. Go for, yeah. Just go for it. Danny, yeah. was, was the phrase yeah. Festivus for the rest of us, that was a phrase that the family did use, right? Your dad came up with? I have these tapes, and they're actually in that filing cabinet, and they were remastered to, to CDs a long time ago, and they're tapes from every year. And in 1976, uh, that year, uh, my dad in the tape recording said, this is a festivist for the rest of us. But what he meant by that was for the living as opposed to the dead, because that year, my grandmother, uh, Jeanette Marie O'Connor O'Keefe, had had a stroke in a supermarket in Jersey City and uh, died. We don't pass away in my family. We die. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that was what it meant. And, and, and you know, uh, and... I remembered that and I sort of spat it out without remembering the context. And then I'm, by the time it's in the script and it's actually working and we're past the table, I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, it's about, about my dead grandma. Eh, it's fine. She's not around. Wow. I'm uh, I always thought it was because um, I actually thought it was true of your family as well. But I always thought it was Frank Costanza's, um, uh, you know, uh, stance against a he was an atheist. Uh, you know, he, he didn't want to play into any of the religiosity. So it was a festival for the rest of us, you know, who don't. Well, the original right. version was, it was those of us who were alive as opposed to the dead. But, but right. coincidentally, my dad was a devout atheist. He actually started off, he, his family were very, very Catholic, and he was actually supposed to be a priest. Every generation, one guy in my family, uh, in my family on that side became a priest. And he uh, had a violent disagreement with uh, the Catholic Church and left it uh, he, in a very colorful, old school, Damon Runyon way. He got in a fist fight with a priest in the Bowery in like the early 50s. And I was like, oh, my God, there must be a story there. And I finally, but you know, I poked him and asked him, but it, no one touched anyone. What happened was there was a disagreement about the candidacy of Adlai Stevenson. It was like it's the one fifth, the one, the one time anyone cared enough about Adlai Stevenson to throw a punch. Um, so I was raised to not be allowed to talk about religion. And this all circles back to my grandma. So I was growing up, I was growing up right outside of Chappaqua. I was very lucky to go to the Chappaqua schools, even though we, we lived in uh, Mount, uh, Mount Pleasant, which, uh, which is sort of unincorporated land back then. But I was instructed to say that I, go, that I lived in Chappaqua because it sounded classier. And as I was growing up in this peculiar environment, Pretty much all my friends were Jewish. I was going to, to Seder's, but I didn't literally know what a mass was. And then when that same grandmother died, Jeanette Marie O'Connor O'Keefe, I said, Daddy, are we going to sit Sheva for Grandma? He said, what? And I said, well, mm -hmm. we're Jewish, Daddy, and that's what we do when someone dies. And he thought I was deranged with grief and, <laughs> and wanted to send me for counseling. And my, my mother said, no, no, you don't understand. They've grown up in a peculiar manner. They are allowed to swear in the house as long as they do it grammatically, but you have forbidden them to discuss religion. So they obviously assume they are what their friends are. So my dad sits me down and says, I understand there's some confusion about your religious identity. Well, I was I was raised Catholic and your mother was raised Quaker, but we've decided that's all nonsense. And I know some of your friends are Catholic, some of your friends are Jewish, but if anyone asks you what you are, you're nothing. Say, I am nothing. <laughs> if they ask you what you are, you say, no, I'm nothing. And so he made me say, I am nothing, which contributes to this. And that was, uh, that was the, Another the woman. Another five years of therapy Jeanette, right there. Yeah, Jeanette O'Keefe well, was well, uh, well, uh, yeah. the, um, uh, the woman who inspired the phrase, uh, Festivus for the rest of us. But, did, and did way, you, I tried to yeah. I tried to sell that story to Curb, and Schaefer was like, "That I, I know I know what happened. It's too weird." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And when Schaefer is saying that, who, by the way, produces Dave, <laughs> some bizarre shows. Was it also uh, anti grounded documentary style? Uh, yeah, exactly. What, now, did your did the family? Um, either accept or pervert any other holiday like was thanksgiving okay was halloween was halloween okay was i mean thanksgiving was weird but it was recognizably thanksgiving we celebrated christmas in a cultural way no, no religiosity uh, at all oh there was by the way another symbol of, of uh, festivus was a sign hand lettered that read fuck fascism that my father <laughs> would tape to the wall he wouldn't nail that to the wall but the thing is that sign also came out sometimes at thanksgiving and sometimes at christmas so the answer is no he didn't pervert any other holidays i guess to to ping pong off of what peter is saying and i i hadn't thought to even get into this because it's kind of a, a heavy question and you don't have to answer yeah, yeah. it but i i can't get a read on whether you feel like 
I mean, I, I, it's easy for me to say I loved my dad and I, and I miss him and, and he was a big part of my life. Do, do, did you have a, a relationship that you valued with your father or was it just too hard to, to find it? I mean, it's complicated, but yeah, absolutely. I love my father. Um, yeah. He was, that was the, it would have been easy if he had been monstrous and unlovable, but he was incredibly charismatic and brilliant yeah. and was very good at talking his way into or out of anything. So yeah, actually in the last, like particularly the last 10 years of his life, actually, you know, arguably since the Festus episode came out, we were you know as close as you can get to someone that damaged. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the other thing that's weird is ostensibly the show we usually start someplace and end up someplace different that it leads you to, was about how families, holidays, even if bizarre, really explain and, and, and kind of create a culture for that family. And the weirdest thing is that your bizarre holiday is, is been 27, 27 years later, it still persists, and it has become, like for families that do it, it has become part of their culture. Aren't I hip? We're doing a Festivus thing. And it's it so, so weird. It's part of their culture. Celebratory. I mean, no yep. one that I know that that you know fools around with Festivus is is doing it as anything other than a Joy, joyful, right. fun, unique. Bingo. You know, so, something that they look forward to. And, and it <laughs> identifies that family as, hey, we're fun, we're quirky, yeah. we're different, ha ha. And they've taken the feats of strength, and they do. I read they do weightlifting. Yeah, they do all kinds of racing. They've taken it, morphed it into their family's own, and, it, deal. and it's pure joy for people. It, it, it's the I've most watched videos thing. of it, and you're absolutely right. It's I, it's joyful, and so in in retrospect, not only were Jerry and Dave and Jeff and Alec right, they they sort of <laughs> retro, they sort of redeemed the that uh, unpleasant morass of of, of memory because right. now this thing that would have been something that you know I tried to you know. Uh, work through in therapy is something that now you know literally dozens of people around the country are having a good time with right. so, more, more than right. dozens, more dozens right. <laughs> um, it, uh, yeah so so yeah. It, they certainly a lot of the poison has been taken out of it by uh by it being now something that it's still just so strange that like a a super like possibly one of the weirdest parts of a very strange childhood uh is now yeah it, it's it's a word it's a what word that my dad made up is now out there it's, what, it's what does just, your son make of it all does he have a take on it he is a very cool teenager who's learned to keep his face impassive as i learned yeah. at a similar age hopefully for different reasons uh i think when i told him his response was cool uh not, so not, uh, at, not, at this point yeah. he thinks it's interesting but it doesn't really affect his life that much yeah um you know do you guys so, do, do you do you i i, I I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to put it out there. Do you do you celebrate it in any way, shape, or form, or acknowledge it in any way, shape, or form? We acknowledge it as yeah. like, okay, this is it's the 22nd. You know, yeah. Tomorrow <laughs> is going to be hard. <laughs> People at school, they say things. Right. Uh, uh, no, yeah. no. It, uh, we we don't. It, here's the thing. We certainly certainly acknowledge it. Um, People are always very nice about it, and uh, it. Uh, and I always feel bad because. You know, I, I wrote it with Jeff and Alec, who ran the show with yeah. Jerry that year, and they had the stories they contributed. I think I argue are better than the Festive story, uh, and they don't get a lot of credit for it. But um, we might at some point. As of right now, we have not. But every yeah. year, it's a little less less unthinkable. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it's uh, it's good. Yeah, the, it, it's weird that the show has has a. Uh, sort of uh time traveled and and uh taken some of the the poison out of that 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 uh, that's a wonderful so thing man. hey dan uh, could you so give us wonderful. some insight because no, people are so fascinated still with seinfeld now it's on netflix and it's just the next generation watches what oh by the way i would be i would be remiss if i didn't say it was it was just the honor of my life it was every day there was a uh -huh. fucking joy it was hard work it was unbelievably hard work as you remember uh particularly that season when i did not have the benefit of working with with mr david but uh yeah, it was such a pleasure to work with you on that, Jason. Oh, oh thank God. you, brother. I right back at you, and I, I will also echo that. You know, people are always saying, "It looks like you guys were having the best time," and <laughs> I always say, "We were, we were having more fun doing it than you'll ever have watching it." So it was, it was, it was just one of those. So Dan, I was going to ask, what was the writers? What did, what did it feel like? I've been in writers' rooms, and it gets very competitive. People don't want to laugh at your joke. 
Everybody's trying to please the showrunner to figure out what's in their head. I've been in those kind of writer's rooms, and I've been in kind of writer's rooms where it's just a lot of fun, where people are just making everybody laugh, and it's just a collective joy to do. What was it? What was your experience in the writer's room? Was it very competitive, or? It was, yeah, but the, the, everyone took it very seriously. Like, this is the greatest TV comedy of all time, and we are tasked with doing this without one of the creators and we better fucking get it right because it's it's a it would be a crime and a disgrace if we didn't so yeah the people it was unbelievably fun it was uh uh making jerry seinfeld laugh in the room is is a you know like a particularly one time when he almost liquid came out his nose it, like it, the birth of my son was nice that was fun i enjoyed it <laughs> but i gotta say seeing jerry laugh like that that, that was the, the possibly the happiest moment of my life it was a joy it was another joy now were there times that people possibly almost came to blows yes because they disagreed about the the um these were very very talented i mean you had uh jennifer crittenden who I, i've worked with since then yeah. who's, who's a genius and and alec and jeff and dave uh, who have together created and run some of the greatest comedies of the last 15 20 years uh and spike fairston i mean these were all people at the absolute top of their game and everyone cared very much about getting it right and not just getting it right but making it as good as it could possibly be so most of the time people were laughing so hard that your voice was hoarse by the end of the day <laughs> uh but yeah sometimes there were very loud disagreements and jerry would would uh, you know, uh, have to have to tamp it down. Um, and did an episode start with an idea, with an overall idea, or because it was a sitcom, we had to have four intersecting stories, which was unique. Did you start oh, with 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 modular? Hey, that may work better with this on this episode, or and moving stuff around. It, absolutely, that sometimes did happen, um, but uh, most of the time you just went into a room with Jerry and uh, Jeff and Alec and Dave. Dave, and you ran a whole bunch of ideas, by oh. them, ideas for a, a capsule story that could be a George story. I, I, I got a freelance. My first episode was season eight on the, uh, the pothole, which was um, Jerry knocks his girlfriend's toothbrush in the toilet and then can't tell her. And she's already brushed her teeth, which actually happened to, to my now wife and me when we lived in New York on the Upper West Side. And I had to tell her for literally years and years. I, don't know, I just thought of that. That was a what if moment. <laughs> that wasn't a real thing. That was like a Marvel. <laughs> And then later, once once she was already pregnant, she there's nowhere for her to go. I said, "Yeah, you know that really happened." I, That's hilarious. Wow. I, I threw your tooth. I sub, I, I threw the toothbrush away and I subbed it out when it was too late. But yeah, you brushed your teeth with toilet water. Uh, so you you'd throw stories at them like that, and they'd approve. When, and once you got a Jerry, a George, an Elaine, and a Kramer approved, then you were sent off to outline it. And it was a, a very intricate structure of. There were big rooms for punch up, which was all the writers. And then there were very small rooms, which is just one person trying to put together an episode they were going to write and getting stories approved by the, 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 the top people. And then there were rewrite rooms, which were somewhere in the middle. And then there were post table punch up sessions, which was again, everyone. Um, so it was incredibly well structured and it had to be because, you know, I remember at the beginning of production, Schaefer said, okay, uh, nobody's uh, nobody make any plans for the weekend. And someone said, what weekend? He said, all weekends. And it was a little, uh, and he was damn. He was correct because yeah. you stayed until it was right. Yes, and and the, that's because the Jeff and Alec were and Dave were remarkably talented showrunners and continued to be. But the tone was set by Jerry because this his work ethic continues to blow me away to this day. I, I remember very specifically we had a nine a.m. rewrite on a Sunday, and I got there a little early by accident. And he was there at 8.45 pacing because he wanted to get the work done. And he brilliant, obviously brilliant, funny. You can't say enough about that. But he also doesn't get credit for being John Starks, for just working harder than any comic in the history of, of comics. Yeah. Well, and had to be in the show and had to, had to then learn and do and, and deliver. Yeah, being in well, the show. you know, I, this is going to turn into a praise Jerry thing. But, you know, people ask me all the time what I think of Jerry's ability. And I he's he will... He is and will remain one of the finest comedians um, that, that certainly of my lifetime and, and perhaps others. And part of that is his ability to walk into any environment, any situation and find the thing that has potential, <laughs> you know, that something in there is funny. And then it's his, I believe to this day, uh, he once told me he spends 
uh, I can't remember what the number is. is it two to three hours a day writing, even when there's uh, nothing comes. He'll sit and he will. It's a famous story now, and I think he's got a movie coming out that is somewhat about this, where he he knew that there was something he had some take on pop tarts, and he, he and he would try and get it, find the thing, and he would work on it. He'd put it up and go, "That's not it," and he'd write again and he'd write again. And and the article that I read said he had been working on it for ten years and still felt like he didn't have it right, you know. And that that kind of work ethic for guys that are telling jokes but it's a joy for him the way he's built the way he's built that's his day is trying to figure yeah. out five hour energy drink what is the wait a minute what's the yeah. deal with five, hour five energy? hours yeah, why five right. hour? yeah. and you watch you can see it as it unfolds but that's what i mean there was in in the movie comedian he and and uh um somebody walk into a, a little bodega right and they go there's something in here that's funny and they don't know what it is and he turns and he sees royal Royal jelly, royal bee jelly. And he goes, oh, yeah, they're making it in a jelly now. So you can put it on bread. <laughs> I mean, it's so not, you know. <clears throat> it, it's that ability, that that savant ability to go, there's something funny here. Danny, you're, 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 you did Veep, you did a lot of other shows. Did that show set you up? Did that change the way you look at comedy? Because you're around guys like that, did that seep in as the osmosis seep in and you go, I'm, I'm changing how I'm writing, maybe not that consciously, but that you look at stuff, you then take on a different a different role the way you see comedy too, because it opens your eyes to different ways to look at stuff. Absolutely, and not unconsciously, completely consciously. I mean, I uh, the first network job I had was a Tonight Show with Jay Leno, where I learned how to you know write a hundred jokes in a in a day. Uh, but yeah, be, and, and not just looking at the product, but being around, be, you know, being exposed to the way that Jerry's mind works and also the way Alec Berg's mind works, Jeff Schaefer, Dave Mandel, uh, just smart, Jennifer Crittenden, very smart, talented people. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I, it, and it, there was nothing unconscious about it. I consciously set about to mimic the work behaviors and work ethics and joke structures and, you know, ways of thinking that, that all these, these, these talented people were, exhibiting on a daily basis. Danny, it is so great to see you. I wish you, uh, this is our holiday show, so happy holidays to you and your family. Happy Whatever you're festivals. celebrating. And, uh, I, I, and I am I, I am truly delighted to see you, and it makes me feel like we should just sit sometime and catch up, but I feel that way about our whole group. I, I would miss them love all. that anytime you just Tell me where I'll even go to the valley for God's sake. I sense. love that. Whoa, I love Jason! It. Did you hear love what he said? I, it, He'll even go to I the valley. The assumption it. that I, I would be in the loud. valley. <laughs> and by the way, you know what's going to happen? You call him and say, "Let's meet at our, in the valley." Who I was? I just saying. I was just yeah, saying that. I was just saying that on the yeah. podcast. <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to Dan, thank you. Be thank well, you my guys. friend. I appreciate it. And thanks for talking about it. I know that it's, it's a it's a weird subject for you, so thanks. People want to know, and I'm flattered that anyone still cares after all this time. Oh, they do. They care. Oh, they do. All right, brother. Take care. I got your All number. Right. I'll be in touch. Please do. All Lovely right, to talk to you both. See you later, Take man. Take care, man. Pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye, I thought my family had some quirks. I got nothing. You know what's I was, weird? I was the father knows best family compared to that. I was. I have all the stuff that I prepare. You know how we go to yes. different subjects. You I have bet. all the stuff about bizarre things families do during the holidays. Yeah, no. Guess what? Yeah, throw that page out. <laughs> wow. You know, wow. All, fest- all, all holidays are bizarre. Do you like? I I just did a little bit of research about some of the things that we equate with most of our holidays, and it's all like did you, like fruitcakes. Fruitcakes is a big Christmas thing. You know, fruitcake. The first fruitcakes apparently. They found them as a weapon. In, no, they, oh. well, you would think they found them buried with uh, with the pharaohs. They were a thing to take to the afterlife. But they and, didn't even them. They didn't the even. You buried them. I think they? I had one in 1982 <laughs> that came from that that batch. Um, holly, you know, holly that they hang oh, in the holly. tree uh, holly, yeah. at Christmas. He kissed on Do you know what it, it is there to symbolize Christ's suffering? The red berries are the blood of Christ. The pointy leaves are the crown right, of right. Did you know that? Yeah, you did know that. All right, mistletoe. Do you know what that what, the, what, the, what that comes from? Mistletoe. Mistletoe was an antidote for. I have no idea. Now mistletoe is from a from a German uh, th- Misht would mean dung, basically poo, and uh, uh, not toe, but tang, mean would means branch. So the literal when when you kiss somebody under the mistletoe, uh, under the the shit dung stick. Tree. Yeah, yeah, right. You're under okay, the shit stick. Wow. Um, sweet. Halloween. People believe that dead souls would return on All Hallows Eve and seek revenge on their enemies. So people would disguise themselves. 
so that the souls could not spot them and take their revenge. That's how the dressing up and the masks. And I mean, it's all bizarre. The, the Chicago River gets dyed every single right, 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 right. since 1962. Right. I mean, and, but you know what? That does give you a sense. It's it gives all cities, bizarre. It gives cities and families a sense of their identity. And it is weird that Danny Sick Holiday yeah. ends up as big as, as it is. As being a thing. As being a thing. Google Hive, what do you got? Well... <laughs> That is some strange holiday stuff, but I thought that uh, we might want to go back a little bit older to some of the absolute first holidays that were uh, in, in history. Oh, you mean like, oops, I made a fire day kind of thing? <laughs> Look, it's yeah, a yeah, wheel. Exactly. Don't have that. Here's one, a Roman holiday, which you probably have never heard of. It's called Saturn uh, Saturnalia. Okay. Saturn I have heard of that. I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Have you? Okay. It's it was an ancient pagan holiday honored by the Romans and the god Saturn. Okay, so that's the whole sure. thing about the godern, which is uh, Saturn is the god of sowing and seeding. So it was a solstice type of thing, but it would took place somewhere between December seventeenth and twenty fourth. And there are a lot of similarities between this and Christmas. Mm -hmm. The festivities considered uh, 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 consisted of drinking, eating lavishly, giving presents. Mm -hmm. But here's where it gets fun. Wealthy Romans paid for the destitute uh, to swap clothes with them and like like do a like a, like a <laughs> Freaky Friday type of sure, thing with yeah. like slaves and the and the destitutes. And uh, while normally the togas were white, they would often swap them out for colorful ones, a lot of times green and red, which, of course, later became the, oh, the colors. Oh, wow, it Christmas. writes itself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I was just going to say, go. we got to wrap it up, Google Home, but I will tell you something. That's a plot yeah. of a... We should write it. The Roman guy swaps, and now he's stuck, and they don't believe that he's really the I Roman guy, and he's know. the cheap guy. I don't he's got to go to the poor aqueduct. What's your weirdest family tradition? What's the weirdest one? We don't do really weird. My family was weird every day. Yeah. But I think the fact that we had, when growing up, no, tra <laughs> no tradition. Yeah. With my father, it was the equivalent of Dan, except there was a passive aggressive quiet. We never yeah. had a tree. We never had a Hanukkah bush. We never had a Christmas thing, whatever. Now we, we do everything. Yeah, we, we celebrate the, everything. Yeah. I, I harangued my parents along. I really wanted a Christmas tree. And they were like, no, we're not doing it. We're Jewish. I go, it's not It's not a Christian thing. It's a pagan thing. It's, a, it's just pretty. Why can't? And they wouldn't go and they wouldn't go. And they finally, <laughs> my mother brought in, I, I will never forget. It, it was like a, a little miniature bonsai tree stripped bare of any foliage painted white and and they draped things on how <laughs> that big was our how big Hanukkah, but about you know a foot like and a half. foot and a half. That's yeah. a happy world and it was the oh. saddest looking thing and i went what and and i have actually said to to dana should we do a should we do a tree no and i go what, what, when did you become super jew that you so <laughs> she's just adamant she doesn't want the tree. we started with big stuff and every year it got and i didn't i didn't complain we're not, the, and the next door family where we used to live is the one that you can see from space. What is that about? Those people who put up what eight million dollars, they spend. Yeah. They start in July and they put it up. We have a, we have two houses in our neighborhood. One does Halloween and one does uh, Christmas. And it's, it's like the thing. Halloween guy I know is spending thirty thousand bucks for you know. It's a their night. family's. I told you, family's it's a culture. Thing. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever your holiday <laughs> beliefs or traditions may be, happy holidays to you from yes, all of us here at yes, Really No yes. Really. And Thank you gift. for uh, following along. We've been on the air almost a year at the point that this will air. And and uh, and happy uh, holidays, happy holidays to, you, to you, sir. Mr. And, uh, and, a, and a lovely new year. And yeah. uh, God bless. Yeah. To if everybody. you believe in to such everybody. things.